All right, Erev Tov, good evening. We are back in our Rambam Mishneh Torah. If you're in the Rav Kapach edition of the Mishneh Torah, you'll want to find yourself on page Lamed Chet. Lamed Chet. Tonight's shiur was dedicated to the Rav Lama of Dr. Arthur Platt. Chaim Ozer Ben Ha'ar. Also, Devar Mayam, remind me the Hebrew name. Oh, Israel Yosef Chaim Yisra- Ben Leah. Yisrael Yosef Chaim Ben Leah. Also, you should have a Rav Hashanah. He needs our tefillot and our learning too. We dedicate the shoot to him as well. Thank you very much. Page Nam and Ched, the Rambam's introduction. We're two lines up from the bottom of the page. So the last word in the line says Shemaya. You see that? In the main section, in the top. So there's a little chafzayin right next to it. If you're on page Lamed Chet, um, no, the first word on the line is Uvit, but the last word is Shemaya. Last word on the line is Shemaya. Yeah, very good. Shemayav av Talion. So the next generation of Zugot, of pairs of Chachamim, meaning one who is a Nasi and one who is av Betadin, are Shemaya v'av Talion. Shemaya v'av Talion, Gerei HaTzedek, a righteous converse to Judaism. This phrase is going to be a problem for us. Not today, tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to deal with what exactly is the idea here of Gerei HaTzedek? Are you, could they have been Gerei HaTzedek? Are they descendants of Gerei HaTzedek? Are they themselves Gerei HaTzedek? Not for today. Don't get stuck on it. Uvedinam. So Shemaya and Avtalion, who are righteous converts, and their Betadin, Kiblum Yehuda v'Shimon Uvedinam. They received their oral tradition from Shimon, Rabbi Shimon ben Shatach, and Rabbi Yehuda ben Tabai, both of whom we discussed last week. So this is the next generation. You have here an Asi and an Abitadin. Both of them are Gerei HaTzedek. Let's translate now literally that they're Gerim. It could be they're just descendants of Gerim. We'll discuss that tomorrow at length. Rav Kapach has his own footnote here in Kavchet. But before we can understand the lives of Shemaya and Avtalion, we have to understand the world in which they lived. And so today's shiur was dedicated to understanding the background of where Shemaya and Avtalion lived, what was going on in their lifetime. And then from there, we're going to discuss uh, everything that we can about Shemaya and Avtalion tomorrow night, Vizan Hashem. So for tonight, I attached the Gemara in the Zoom invitation. Don't look at it yet. We're not up to that yet. Shemaya and Avtalion are most famously known to us, not just as the rabbis of Hillel and Shammai, who we obviously learn a lot about throughout the Talmud, but we know them because of their teachings in Pirkei Avot. In the first chapter of Pirkei Avot, Shemaya and Aftalion tell us two things. Shemaya Omer, Shemaya says, Ehov et HaMelacha, love work, love working. Usna et HaRabbanut, and you should hate any type of position of authority. Very good. Rabbanut, that's it. The word Rabbanut, what is a Rav? When someone calls someone a Rav. Literal translation. Okay, Chacham means a wise man. Very good. So that's one title we call Rabbanut. So what is the definition of Rav? Master, like we say, and have the, a thousand differences, ribon haolamim, or the master of the world. So in singular, rav, one rabbi, master, ribi umori, mori veribi, my master, my teacher. A more is a teacher. A rav is a master. So this word here of rabbanut has to do with any position of authority that one might have. And don't become close with the government. 
Very interesting. Yeah. What is the word tidvada? Familiarity. From the language of yidya, yodia, to know. Adam yadat chava yishto. Adam knows his wife chava. A closeness. You have to deal with government, deal with government. But don't get too close. It's bad for you. Why? We'll discuss. I mean, why? You could probably write your own book, why? But <laughs> there's a reason here why Shemaya is telling us. Avtadion Omer, Avtadion says, Chachamim, wise man, he's haru b'divrachem, be very careful with the things that you say. Shema tachovu chovat galut, because you may become guilty and require exile. V'tiglu l'makom ma'im haraim, and you'll be forced to exile yourself to a place of evil waters. And your students who come after you will drink from these evil waters and they will die. And the name of heaven will be desecrated because of you. Let's say if Shemaya's teaching made, was above board, something we can understand, Avtalion's teaching comes off as something very cryptic. Very cryptic and requires darsheni. We have to learn it. What does it mean? Actually, I didn't come to speak to you so much today about Avtalion as much as the teaching of Shemaya. We're talking today about Shemaya and Avtalion, who are the Chachamim who come into the Jewish picture at the end of the leadership of Shlom Tzion, the queen. Remember we mentioned her last time? She was the sister of Shimon ben Shatach, who was hiding him from her husband, King Yanai. Remember? Shlom Tzion, after the death of King Yanai, we said she was successful and doing something. Not only did she bring the Pirushim back into power, but she also was successful in stabilizing the Jewish government at the time. Stabilized much of what was going on in her time period. Unfortunately, this doesn't last forever. This doesn't last forever, and in this introduction that I've been suggesting for you over and over to read the books of Rabbi Benny Lau, I'm going to use some of his quotes today. Right after Yanai's death, his son, Hurkunus, otherwise known as Hurkunus II, he was appointed both as the king and as a Kohen. How can you be both a king and a Kohen? Which government are we talking about here? Which Jewish government is leading the Jewish people in this period? Very good. The Hashemonaim. That's right. The Hashemonaim. So the Hashemonaim are not from the tribe of Yehuda. They are Kohanim. And therefore, one who is a, uh, the king can also technically be the Kohen Gadol. And that's exactly what happens. And we know in this period that anybody who wants can be a Kohen Gadol. It's all about money and connections and everything else and the very little to do with righteousness. Hukunus becomes both the Kohen Gadol and the king. At the same time, he has a younger brother. Forgive me if I butcher some of these names here that are not Hebrew names. Aristobolus, 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 maybe. He is the younger brother of who? I think you pronounce it Aristobolus. Aristobolus, very good. You see? He decides that really he should have been the king. He was ready to be the king and take over for his father. So he does what two brothers always should do, and they go to war. He gathers together troops around him. His brother, who was not prepared, it seems, for this battle, is defeated very quickly. And Aristobulus, he takes power from Hurkunus II. Hurkunus surrendered momentarily, but he wasn't happy with the situation of losing his kingdom. And so he decided to reach outside of the Jewish world and make allies with other people, non-Jewish leadership, who would help him take back the kingdom from his brother. So a few stories you see here, civil war happening. It's not enough though that there's civil war. One of the Jewish factions reaches outside of the Jewish world to ask for help for problems that are taking place inside of Jerusalem. It is a mess like you could ever have a mess. Who does he reach out to? His friend is known as Antipater. Antipater enlists the help of the king of Edom. Where's Edom? Rome. Rome. The king of Rome. This is, you ever wonder how the Romans get here? <laughs> king Aretas of Edom. Together, they surround the place 
where Arist how do you say it? Aristobulus. Where Aristobulus is hanging out, I'm going to assume that that is the Bet HaMikdash, Harabait, based on other stories that we're going to read soon. They're hiding in Yerushalayim, and essentially they siege the younger brother who's hiding in Yerushalayim. And it's in this context that I'm going to share with you a story found in the writings of Josephus. Josephus, the Jewish historian, who's writing about things that happened in this time. If we mention uh, Chacham in the past, known as Choni HaMe'agel, or Choni HaMe'agal, depending which versions of the Talmud you're going to be looking at, Choni is known very famously for having one famous character trait, aside from being a Chacham. What is he famous for? Or drawing a circle and staying in it until water fell from the Very good. Magia, the circle. He draws a circle and stands in a circle. And says he will not move from the circle until a Kadosh Baruch brings rain. And the rain comes, a famous uh, uh, piece of Agadah. Choni, seems to be the same one, is now brought into the story, not in the writings of the Talmud, but here he's brought in by Josephus. And I'll read to you in English, there's no reason anyways. It's translations of translations. I might as well read to you in English. There was a certain Chonyo. That's what he calls him. Chony. Who was a righteous man and dear to Hashem. Once in a time of drought, he prayed to Hashem to end the drought. And Hashem had heard his prayer and sent rain. This man hid himself when he saw the civil war continue to rage. But he was taken to the camp of the Jews and was asked to, take, to place a curse and Aristobulus and his fellow rebels, just as he had by his prayers put an end to the drought. So he wanted to remove himself from the political situation at the time. The Jews wouldn't let him. They captured him and against his will, forced him to come to the enemy camp of one of the brothers, so that he should use his power of prayer to curse the brother who was besieged inside. It always amazes me, the same king last week who killed Chachamim, is also worried about Berkat Amazon. The same kings that are willing to kill their brothers are the same ones who are looking for rabbis to pray on their behalf for things that, it's an unbelievable world. You think about the twisted worldview of these religious, so to speak, personalities. These twisted things still exist in our world today. Nothing changed, just different. In, when in spite of his refusals and his excuses, he was forced to speak by the mob. Notice the mob. Every time Jews get involved in mobs, this mob mentality is very dangerous for the way Torah Judaism works. But the mob, they forced him to speak. He stood up in their midst and he said, O oh God, King of the universe, since these men standing beside me are your people, and those who are besieged are your Kohanim, your priests, I beseech you not to hear them against these men, or to bring to pass what these men ask you to do to those others. Meaning, Hashem, please don't listen to either of them. This is your people, those are your Kohanim, don't listen to either of them what they want from you. And when he had prayed in this manner, the villains among the Jews who stood around him, stoned him to death. It's found in Antiquities 14 of Josephus. And you see here, that right at the beginning of this war, there's a chacham involved, and really this sets the stage for a civil war between two brothers. This is the end of the glorious story of Chanukah, King Matityahu, the Chakmakabim, the Chanukah miracle which starts this dynasty of Chashmonaim. It ends, ironically, if those were brothers that stood up against their other brothers in order to bring uh, uh, Kiddush Hashem, to the name of the Creator, it ended with two brothers fighting against each other, desecrating the name of HaKadosh Baruch The Talmud in Masechet Sota records this story. And this, I want to read to you inside. So if you look at the Zoom link, I attached a link to Sota 49b. Did I bring the right volume? Sutta 49b, this is the end, this last page of Masechet Sutta. 
if you are actually inside of a Gemara, if you have the Safari link, that should take you exactly to the right place. But if you're looking in the Gemara, it's one, two, three, four, five, six lines up in the narrow lines. Tanura Banan, our rabbis taught. Do you see this? You guys have it in Safari? Do you see? Baruch, you found it? It's the bottom of the Zoom invitation. Zev, do you find it? Okay. Uh, no, over there it should open up right to the right place. Yeah? Tanur Abanan, our rabbis taught. Kishiratsu malchai bet hashmonai zeh zeh. Sorry. Kishitsaru malchai bet hashmonai zeh zeh. When the brothers of the house of the hashmonaim went to civil war against each other. Hurkanus was on the outside of Jerusalem or outside of the Ben Mignash, exactly the geographic location, I don't know. And Aristobulus was inside. Here, uh, she says, These were the two brothers that were fighting over the kingdom, Hurkanus and Aristobulus. He was outside. That he was outside of Jerusalem. So not outside of Ben Midash, outside of Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem. And he had with him Roman soldiers. So it's the Jews who bring the Romans to attack the city of Jerusalem. Yeah? Welcome to Jewish history. Every single day, the Kohanim inside of the Ben Mikdash would lower down a bucket with coins to pay for animals to be brought to sacrifice in the Tamid sacrifice in the Ben Mikdash. So they needed to make sure that even though they were under siege, that they would be able to have a steady supply of animals to sacrifice in the Ben Mikdash. What do you think the enemy soldiers did? Every day, they would bring them animals. They also agreed that the Ben Mikdash, the service, had to continue. Remember I told you about religious people? These guys are intent. They're in civil war. They're ready to murder each other. But they want to make sure that the Avodat, the Mikdash, it doesn't stop. Like Jews today. They're ready to kill each other. All they want, though, is to kill goats on Havabai. That's what they're waiting for. You think anything changed? Don't judge them. We're living in the same reality. Hayasham Zakenecha, there was one elder there inside of the walls of Jerusalem. Now, this story is brought in the Talmud in the context of one should not teach his child Greek wisdom. And this story is going to be used to show that one should not study Greek wisdom. Hayasham Zakenecha, there was one elder there. Shahayam Mekir Bechuchmat Ivanit, that he was familiar with Greek wisdom. Laaz Lahem Bechuchmat Ivanit, he spoke to them in the foreign language, in Greek wisdom. So understand clearly that Chochmai Greek wisdom, and the Greek language are not the same thing. They're two different things. But there's a rivash. A rivash, if you look in the Shalot V'Tshuvot, in Tshuva uh, Memhe 45. I believe the rivash has a tshuva, a beautiful tshuva, about what it means, Chochmai Yivanit. Over there he mentions Greek wisdom is the ability to speak not clearly. To teach ideas, but in a very confused and cryptic fashion. Uh, you ever heard an academic speak? I don't mean to offend academics. My wife is in the field of academia. Every time my wife asks me, can you please read this paper? It's a great paper, read it. I told her, listen, uh, I feel like, uh, you know, it's a, the voice, the voice of the paper is in English. All the letters are in English. All the words are in English. But they don't make sense, and I think that I speak English. They don't make sense. The way they write, it's a certain way to write in which you are meant to feel stupid. It's not meant to convey information, to share with you ideas in a clear fashion. It's not even sophisticated. I know I'm going to get in trouble one day with an academic somewhere. But it's made to be written in a way 
that you're not in the club, you don't understand what we're talking about. That's how it's written. Am I right? Anybody ever read these papers and understand what I'm talking about? Chokhmah Yivanit is the same way. It's the ability to talk about nothing in a very sophisticated way. That you make yourself feel smart. I once spoke about this a number of years ago in the Kuzari class. But that's not the point for today. Chokhmah Yivanit, so he's speaking, this man inside of the walls is speaking to the people outside of the walls. Amar lehen, he tells them, Kozman shoskim ba'avoda, enim sarim biyadchem. So long as the Kohanim continue to worship Hashem and serve in the Ben Mikdash, you will never be able to conquer them. Now, it's interesting. What is the purpose of the Zaken? Why is he why is he speaking in Greek wisdom fashion? Why is he on the inside but helping the people on the outside? This is already a piece of Agada, not for me today. Le Machar the next day, Shil Shilunahem Dinarim Bakupa. The Kohanim send down the coins like every day. They send down the coins in, in the bucket. And the other Jews put in their bucket a pig. A pig? Instead of sending them with an animal that is kasher to offer in Yerushalayim, they send them a pig. The moment that he reaches half the height of the wall of Jerusalem, Na'at tziponav, he sticks his nails into the wall. Bachoma, that's what it seems to be written in other versions. Nizda'aza Eretz Yisrael, Arbamot Parsa. And the land of Israel, all of it shook 400 Parsa. This pig sticks his feet into the walls of Yerushalayim. You can imagine an uglier thing than for what Am Yisrael considers to be the most impure animal, to stick his feet into Jerusalem in the middle of a war between two families of Kohanim that are fighting over the kingdom, and the Greeks are, uh, the Romans are here helping. The land of Israel shakes. Otasha, at that moment, Ambu. A rabbi said, Arur Adam Shigadel Chazirim, cursed is the man who raises pigs. Arur Adam Shilmad Vno Chokhmai Vanit, and cursed is the person who teaches his son Greek wisdom. I don't wish to continue the Agada here, or even what happens that year. But this is really the beginning of the end of Yerushalayim. Correct, they tried, they tried. The Rambam was influenced by the Greeks, but this is obviously a fallacy, as we know, but they don't know. Let's not deal at all with the story, the details of the story, maybe even the history of this, I don't know exactly what it means, the Eretz Israel is shook, and, and what happens here. But at this point in time, there was a king, Pompey. He was busy pillaging the whole Middle East, he realizes the Jewish people are split, and he comes into Yerushalayim and takes over Jerusalem because the two brothers are so busy fighting with each other, there's nobody to protect the land of Israel. We continue for a few decades to rule over Eretz Israel, but living under Roman occupation. So there are a number of leaders that change hands in this period, but the Jewish people never again see freedom. We are in Eretz Israel pretending to run our own country while being under the occupation of Roman forces. At that point in time, Antipater, if you remember, we talked about him, who came from Edom, he rose to power, he makes a political alliance with Hukunus against his brother Aristobulus. For a number of years, they led the Jewish people under the tutelage of Julius Caesar. So this is the time period that we're dealing with. He then appointed his sons as governors over the country, one in Yerushalayim, the famous of them, Herod Hodus in the Galilee. About 10 years later, there was a war between the two of them. He had Hurkonus disqualified from the Kehuna by cutting off his ears. A Kohen who has a physical blemish is unable to be a Kohen. And so he took him and maimed him by cutting off his ears. He killed Fasael, 
Hurdus was forced to flee, finding refuge in Rome, where he becomes part of the Roman Senate. He then returns in the year 40 BCE back to Israel with a huge military force. He wages war uh, against he who overthrew him, and he finally succeeds in establishing his rule in Eretz Israel. In this whole war between brothers, enemy forces, non-Jewish forces, everybody destroying Yerushalayim altogether, and the Jews just helping them do it. This is the generation in which Shemaya and Aftalion take leadership of the Jewish community. That needs to be very clear. Because Shemaya and Aftalion didn't step up to a comfortable Jewish community. They weren't involved in the Jewish people when everything was nice and cozy, Yerushanaim, yeah, the Romans. They were in the middle of, of destruction. I don't know another word to tell you aside from destruction. That's what Yerushanaim was like right now. And then maybe now we can begin to understand what Shemaya was teaching the Jewish people. What did Shemaya tell us? Ehov et ha You should love work. What does it mean you should love work? Ehov et ha usnat rabanut hate positions of authority. Ve'al tidvadal ha-reshut. And one thing for certain, don't get too close to the government. It's in this context that Shemaya is speaking. The world is a mess. These political parties are out there literally to destroy each other and everybody who stands in their way. The Chachamim, who until today were very involved in government of the Jewish people, are telling their Talmidim, the Pharisees, the Pirushim, take a step back. Take a step back. Don't get involved. It's not the right time. You know what happens when people get involved? in these partisan politics, is that ultimately it will come to disgrace you. Because you took a stance on one side, and now you lost. What happens? You lost. Oh, the Jews were for them, or the Jews were for them. And then what happens? The other party that wins will never forget the Jewish people stood up against them. It doesn't help. Shemayan Aftayon, give them advice. Be bipartisan. I am not speaking current politics. You extrapolate whatever you need. The current politics. It's not safe for the Jewish people to get involved, in a, especially in a messy situation where the future is uncertain, to get involved and be partisan when it comes to politics that are not theirs. Al titvada l'arishu, just take a step back. It's not your place. What should you do? Ehovah melacha. Get involved in working. Keep yourself busy with productive things. Snat rabanut. Stay away from anything which gives you authority over other people. The Jewish country has been destroyed. Why do you want to still be involved in government? When do you look and say, it's filthy, it reeks? When do you just say, I have to live my life of rebuilding myself? I'm going to work hard, I'm going to take care of my family, I'm going to raise my, I'm going to have to do the things that I need to do. This country that we all believed in, this revolution of Hanukkah, you have to understand, this is the end of the story of Hanukkah. Hanukkah story now becomes a failure. We lose the Jewish state. And yet we're still celebrating Hanukkah. But we lose the Jewish state. And our Chachamim say, you know when you on your GPS and you make a wrong turn? And it says, root recalculation, and it's pending. What's the right way to go? Well, what's the right way to go? You have to make sure you make right decisions until you know the right way to go. Chachamim are root recalculating here. And so they stayed away from anything political, any positions of power. If last week's Chachamim are involved in the Sanhedrin, and they're involved in the Bet Midnash, and they're involved, and they're involved in every type of government sitting between kings and their wives, and Persian delegates that are coming from other countries, this week's Chachamim, this next generation, you don't see that at all. This next generation, you see Chachamim, reclaim the only place they actually have authority over. The only place? The Bet Midrash. The Bet Midrash. If we're going to recreate the Jewish people, we're going to rebuild the Jewish people from inside of the walls of the Bet Midrash. It shouldn't surprise you then. The students of Shemaya and Aftalion are the great leaders of the Jewish people, Hillel and Shammai. Tomorrow, B'zad Hashem, we're going to discuss what is going on in the Jewish people. That the two leaders, it's not one, the two leaders who lead the Jewish people are those who seem to come to Am Yisrael from the outside. They're Gerei HaTzedek, they're righteous converts. In all of the leadership of the Jewish people, 
These were the people who were worthy of stepping up to the plate. Why? What is the significance of that? And what does that mean to their students? What are the messages that we walk away from their teachings with? But for tonight, I think that this message is important. The world of politics is a mess. I don't think it's ever been clean, but it's messier than it ever has been. All you need to do is look in this country, look in Israel, look whatever country you're involved in right now, and you just realize, I don't have nice words to say, I'm not going to say it. Rabbi Yosef Masas, I once read you a letter. We didn't record it, it was a mistake. We didn't record it. Rabbi Yosef Masas has a letter begging the Jewish people to be quiet when it comes to the politics of nations that they are living in. The American Jew doesn't like to hear this. The American Jew thinks, I'm an American like everybody else. I can do whatever I want. I can say whatever I want. I have the freedom of speech. I can, I can vote for this. I can wave this flag. I can put this bumper sticker, whatever it is you do. And that's true. As an American, you have all the rights as another American. As a Jew, though, you don't. As a Jew, and I know that this mentality that I'm sharing with you, it's not popular. It's considered an exile mentality, a suppressed Jewish mentality, that those of you who know me long enough know that the pride and joy of Am Yisrael is to be an autonomous nation that is independent, even if it's an exile. So to give up every, all of your integrity to be second best to a nation that's not yours. We're grateful. We're grateful for what we have. But you're invited to someone else's house, and you see a husband and a wife fighting with each other. Do you think it's a good idea to get involved and take sides? Someone invites you when they tell that story about a guest who comes for lunch. And the husband and wife, they're fighting the whole way home from the bed. Like, what can you do? You're the guest. So you're listening there awkward. You know what to do. You come into the house, and the guest sees the husband is so mad, he takes all of the food off the plata, throws it out the window. And the wife says, yeah, that's what you're going to do. She takes all the dishes, throws them out the window. And the guest says, yeah. He takes the table and chairs, throws them out the window. They all look at him, are you crazy? He says, listen, I thought we were eating lunch outside. I was just helping. We're living in this place where nobody knows what's happening right now. Everybody's fighting everybody. And Am Yisrael keeps sticking its nose in business that doesn't belong to it. We're here for as long as we're allowed to be here for. But one day this will end. We will not be here forever. I'm sorry to break it for you. Everybody is, every country we've been in has ended like that. And sticking our nose in the face of other people who are the rightful owners of this country or not is up to you to figure out. But those who are leading this country, Stay away. You have feeling you have an obligation to vote. You have to go. So vote, fine. Chachamim said it's a mitzvah. Go. But why does it have to be all over your Shabbat table? Why do you wear your paraphernalia to the Ben Knesset? Why are you busy putting bumper stickers on your cars? What is wrong with people? When did you care so much last time about a machloket, the Shulchan Aruch and the Rama or the Rambam and the Ravad? Oh, they put a bumper sticker up. You don't. You hold like Maran and those people hold like the Rama. You don't fight about it. But about politics, American politics, Israel, what, what's wrong with people? Shemaya and Aftarion say, don't get involved. Don't get cozy with people who are not cozy people. Later on, Pakyavot is going to tell us, the essence of government is they bring you close only when they need you. And when they don't need you, they don't even remember your name. I think so often of spies of countries that went out to spy for their country, but they know. The moment they get caught, their country is going to pretend they never heard of them before. Now, I understand you being so patriotic or so nationalistic, you want to give up your I get it. I have a hard time. I do so much for you, and now you forget you even know me. I get it. I understand the political long run, the long story. I get it. But there's a whole world like that. You think that all these people you're fighting your friends for and you're losing family over, do you think any of them actually care about you or your life or your job or your children? Do you think anybody of them cares if you can make your mortgage payments or you can pay your rent or you can take... None of them, no, they don't care about you. They don't know who you are. So why ruin your life and your friendships and your families over things that are not important to Amisai? Ehovah the Malacha. Love to work hard. Snat banut. Stay away from anything that's political. Valtit vadala rashut. And especially, don't get yourself involved in any form of government whatsoever. If we take the wisdom of Shema and Aftalion, I believe that our next generation could look like Hillel and Shammai, but that's for tomorrow.